Welcome each one of you out. I know we're all virtual and we decided to do that this morning, go virtual on Sunday nights and Wednesdays also, but uh, we're carrying on uh, for Jesus till Jesus comes. And I pray that y'all all listening in to get a blessing out of our service tonight. I did want to read a few verses out of the first chapter of uh, St. John. I guess we're all pretty familiar with this. Uh, chapter, but uh, this is a Christmas season, and uh, we need to think about the true meaning of Christmas. And it tells us in verse 1 In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Then on that verse 14 And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten Father full of grace and truth. And skip on over verse 17. It says, For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And that's what these verses are all talking about. It's Jesus who was born of a manger. And I think about Christmas. You, you, you think of the manger scene and uh, Christ being born there. But I always think about his life and how he went to the cross for each and every one of us that we could be saved yeah. and uh, have something to look forward to. You know, it's uh, peace in my heart and knowing that I have someone to look to in this way of life. You know, see, so many times I don't know what to do, but I know I have a, a mighty God that can help me along this way of life. And uh, that's for everyone. This need to come and accept Christ personal Savior. If you don't know him, I pray you'll come to know Christ as your Savior. And tonight as we come, it's always needful we go to the Lord in prayer. <coughs> Let's pray for one another, everyone that's listening in, our church, our fellow churches around. There's so much going on with this COVID-19. We need to remember all of our health care workers, uh, ones up there at uh, Murray Manor. There's very few of those up there that don't have a COVID. Uh, let's remember leaders of our country, our policemen, and uh, let's remember Brother Eddie as he comes and uh, uh, preaches uh, tonight. It's a little different coming to church. It gets mighty quiet in here. There's three of us here, but uh, the Bible tells us two or three together together, the Lord will be in the midst, and that's what I'm looking forward to tonight. 
and we can carry on for him and uh, I tell you we just give him the praise and for all this three of us here and I don't know how many is listening in but let's just praise the Lord together so let's go to the Lord in prayer Father God we thank you for blessing us with health and strength that we can be in your house again tonight Lord just uh, continue to be with us just give us health and strength just bless all those that's listening in Lord just uh, give us all a blessing for all high, Lord. You're the almighty God, Lord. Yes. We're looking to you for help in this uh, trying time we're in, Lord. We pray you just uh, continue to keep the heads up around us, Lord, that we can continue on. We'll get through this uh, uh, time we're living in here in our country, the whole world, Lord. We pray you'll just make a way for us, Lord. We just thank you for sending your darling son to die on earth. For us on that old rugged cross, Lord, how he paid our sin debt, Lord. We just uh, praise you for that, Lord. Just bless the sick and afflicted and all those requests that Graham brought before us from time to time. For those that's uh, sick, Lord, that's uh, uh, not going to make it, Lord, it's seemingly, Lord. We pray you just uh, be with those families, our Lord. And Lord, just be with Eddie as he preaches tonight, giving the words we need of. Let your words just. Uh, Go out and uh, convict hearts, Lord. Help us all. We'll just grow. We'll ever be ready to meet you there in the sky, Lord, when our time comes, Lord. We just give you the praise, God. You're so good to us. We just give you so much praise. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So at this time, we ask Brother Eddie to come on uh, and preach. He might even sing for us tonight. Well, it's good to be with you this evening. We're certainly in a little bit uh, different situation tonight than we have been for the last few months. And that's going back to uh, uh, simply Facebook virtual uh, services on uh, Wednesday night and Sunday nights. But still, uh, we can have church this way and uh, kind of uh, lessen the... Uh, uh, possibility of being around one another here in the services and uh, just eliminating as much as we possibly can at this present time. I know a lot of churches have, some have even discontinued their services in the life of the first of the year because of all the outbreaks that's been in Smith County and there are a, a bunch and I think we're running somewhere close to uh, 30 a day on average or right close to that. And uh, so we got a lot that's going on, uh, and we've got a lot we need to be praying about, a lot of folks we need to be praying for, uh, and just uh, pray that these uh, Wednesday night and Sunday night services, as we meet together, that, that uh, the Lord will be in the midst of it and bless us, and uh, just uh, speak to our hearts. I know uh, there's only, I can only see the, the uh, uh, Brother Gary and Brother Stan that are here with me tonight. Uh, in the church, I can't see you. You can sit there and, and look at me and see me, but I'm going to just have to uh, kind of in my mind just look back across the congregation or the church and and uh, remember just about where all of you sit and and just kind of picture you here in the congregation. So we're we're to, we're going to worship the Lord, and that's what these services are going to be about. It's just going to be our uh, worship time, uh, you there wherever that you're at at home, or uh, we're, some of you might have uh, gotten together as, as a group, and uh, I hope that's not a big group, but uh, a group of you may have gathered together and, and are listening. But whichever way we're doing it, the Lord can be here, the Lord can be there, and the Lord can bless us with his word tonight. Now this morning we looked at the uh, conquest of Jericho, and certainly the Lord just, uh, I thought, got in the midst of our service this morning and blessed. And boy, it's a joy to be able to stand and preach the Word of God this morning and feel the presence and the anointing uh, of the Holy Spirit in our midst and in our service. And this evening, we're continuing on in our study and in our series of sermons in the book of Joshua. And actually, this... Uh, uh, one that we're going to look at tonight covers two chapters. It's in chapter 7 
and it's in chapter 8, and it's the conquest of Ai. And I was thinking coming out the road just a minute ago, if uh, the children of Israel would have went and defeated Ai the first time, there wouldn't be a need for chapter, uh, the majority of chapter number 7, and uh, there wouldn't be a need for chapter number 8 of going back and having to fight Ai again. So, uh, but it, nonetheless, it's in two chapters, and I'm going to leave that up to you to read all of it. And I'm going to only uh, going to read a, a few verses out of chapter number 7. We'll make comment, we'll make mention out of both chapters as we go along and uh, try to share with you what, uh, if we'd have gotten to meet together in church tonight, this is what you would have gotten had you been here, so you're going to get it there uh, where you're at this evening. Uh, chapter 7, verse 1 says, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of uh, Zerar, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho, where they had just defeated and won the battle, and he sent those men to Ai, which is beside beth Aven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, Let not all the people go up, but let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. And make not all the people to labor thither, for they are but few. So there went up thither of the people about 3,000 men and fled, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about 30 and 6 men, for they chased them from before the gate even into Shabarim, and smote them in the going down. Wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Father, would you help us this evening? And I pray for the, our unseen congregation and we always have that every time we meet together here in the house of the Lord we've got that unseen congregation that meets with us and some of them not even here in Virginia some down in in Texas and some in other parts of the country and Lord we thank you for our listeners and we thank you for our church family tonight that are listening there at home. And I pray, Lord, that you would take the message and the Word of God and you would touch their hearts and you would touch my heart tonight. And as I studied this past week and made preparations of this message, I said, Lord, and you just broke my heart with this passage of Scripture. And you dealt so, uh, uh, I, I don't want to use the wrong word, but I believe this is the right word, You've dealt very uh, tenderly but seriously with my heart on matters that we're going to look at tonight. And so I pray, Lord, that as our unseen congregation of people out there tonight are listening, that you'll speak to their heart as well. And Lord, when we come to the conclusion and get to the end of the message tonight, may we all, whether it be there, whether it be here in the church house, Lord, may we stop just a few minutes and, Lord, acknowledge what we have received to bring some things and lay them on the altar and say, I'm going to nail them down tonight. I'm, I'm going to take care of business with the Lord tonight in this service. So I pray, Lord, that you'd meet every need as only you're able to do. And we'll thank you and praise you in Jesus' name and amen. Now, all the inhabitants of Canaan were afraid of Joshua and the Israelites prior to what we looked at this morning, prior to their going to Jericho and prior to uh, the destruction of Jericho and the walls falling down and the Israelites going in and taking the city. But after they had destroyed Jericho, the people were very terrified about Joshua and the Israelites. In fact, in chapter 6 and verse 27, if you look at it, the Bible said, So the Lord was with Joshua. And listen to what the last part of verse 27 says. And his fame was noised throughout the country. 
Now, chapter 7 begins with what we call a conjunction, I believe is the proper word. It begins with but. Every time you read something and you get to a word and it says but, you know something is coming after what you have just read that's pretty much going to change the whole thing. Things are not going to be like they were. And the text here doesn't immediately describe Achan's sin. The text only names his sin, then it mentions the consequences of that sin that he committed. Now, the next one in the march for the children of Israel, after crossing the Jordan River and after defeating Jericho, their next one in their march to the sea was Ai. And just as, the, as he did with Jericho, Joshua sends spies out to check out and see how AI is. And they return with a report, and the report, I, I, I kind of get it in my mind, is kind of humorous what they say. They come back, they say, well, the town's rather significant. Uh, we don't need to take everybody up. There's no reason to bother everybody. There's no reason to trouble everybody. Most of the folks can just sit, sit back and take it easy and relax. And we'll take about two or 3,000 men and we'll go up there and we'll whip AI and we'll be back by supper time and we can just have a good evening and we can sit back and relax. And that's pretty much what they were saying. There's no reason to bother everybody. Instead of all the people going against Ai, only a small number attacked the city. And the result is the only defeat that you'll ever find under, uh, uh, under Joshua's leadership. It's the only defeat that he ever experienced. They were driven back. The Bible said that 36 Israelites were killed. All of this happens because of the man that we're going to see in just a few minutes. It all happens because of Achan and Achan's sin and Achan doing what God had instructed the children of Israel not to do. So I want to say this before I move on. Your sin does affect other people. It affects those around you. It affects those that you come in contact with on an everyday basis. So it does affect other people. Folks say, well, my sin only affects me. I'm not hurting anybody else. You are hurting somebody else every time that you sin and don't confess that and get that sin taken care of. The Israelites here who only a short time before were feeling very invincible, now they felt depression. Look what it says in verse number 5 at the end of the verse. The Bible said, Wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. At Jericho, they felt like, man, ain't nobody can whip us. And if they had listened to God, and they had done what God said to do, and they would always went to God in prayer, and sought the leadership and the guidance and the counsel of the Lord, they would never lost a battle. But there's some things that you'll find when they went to Ai that, man, they messed up on. Even Joshua, I think, messed up on it. Joshua, the Bible said, went on his face before God. He asked God why he brought the Israelites to cross the Jordan River just to deliver them into the hand of the Amorites. He also asked, what's going to happen to your name, Lord? What, what's going to happen to the name of God should the people perish in the land of Canaan? He's as much as saying this, if you read into it, God, this is really going to give you a mad name. Lord, I mean, no one's going to want to serve a God who treats the, his children the way you're treating us. If you'll read it, that's pretty much what Joshua was saying when he came before the Lord. Now, we learn from this passage that Israel suffered defeat for three reasons. First of all, they got self-confident. They pursued things. They thought they could handle the situation with only a few of the people when God wanted all of them to go. Don't get self-confident. The battle you won yesterday, the battle that you face tomorrow may be altogether different. And I'll tell you this, the God that you need today and the God that you needed yesterday is the God that you're going to need to fight the battle come tomorrow. 
I don't know what I'll face and you don't know what you'll face, but I'll tell you this, with the help of the Lord, we can make it through anything that we face in this walk of life. Second thing, they were defeated because of prayerlessness. Well, I'll tell you, Christians can be seriously defeated when we fail to pray and take things to God in prayer. They never bothered to take the time to ask God what they should. You read this passage. Uh, take a little while this afternoon, and I read it again. I tell folks, hey, I read the passages uh, multiple times before I come and preach out of them. I read chapter 7 and chapter 8 again, even this afternoon before I came back tonight. Even though I had a pretty clear picture of it in my mind, I wanted to read it again. And you go in there and you read chapter 7 and chapter 8 and you see them going to Ai and the first time that they went, you don't see any indication that they ever prayed about that matter. They never sought the leadership of God. They ever asked God to lead them in the battle. They simply went to battle. They were still thinking about Jericho. And if God could, could, could defeat Jericho, he won't have any trouble with Ai. Boy, Jericho was a lot bigger. Jericho was a lot mightier than Ai was. Isn't it amazing how Jericho was swept without firing a single shot? And the little group that was at Ai killed 36 Israelites, put them in flight. Their hearts melted because of what they had just endured and what they went through. It tells me this. If God's not in it, man, you're fighting a losing battle. And they found that out right quick. God doesn't say uh, uh, that Achan sinned, but the Bible said Israel had sinned. And the third thing, and what, the one that's specifically named, is the fact that Israel had taken the accursed thing. Look back over in chapter 6 a minute. Verse 18. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest you make yourselves a curse when you take the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble in. Now if you just read that and said you'd have to say what's an accursed thing? But verse 19 says the silver and the gold and the vessels of brass and iron are consecrated unto the Lord. They shall come into the treasury of the Lord. So they were pretty well told what they needed to do. So Joshua told, uh, 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 God told Joshua when he's coming before the Lord and he gets down on his face and he begins to cry out to the Lord. God tells him, Joshua, son, get up off your face. Get, quit that whining and that going on and that moaning. And he told him why he had suffered feet at Ai. He then tells him, look down in verse 13. What you need to do is sanctify the people. And say, Sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, There is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Now you'll underline these verses. You've got a pen there handy where you at. Because boy, here is the key to chapter number 7. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until you take away the cursed thing from among you. You know what the Lord's saying here and what God's telling them? Deal with sin first. Take care of the sin problem. If you don't get rid of the sin problem, you're fighting a losing battle. Boy, that's good for us, isn't it? Now, early the next morning, Josh began to investigate the matter. And the Bible said tribe after tribe, they came before Josh. Then came the tribe of Judah. And within that tribe, the Bible said, came the family of the Zarhites, and within in that family was Abdi, and finally came Achan, the son of Carmi. And after Achan sinned and found him out, he confesses that sin. It's amazing sometimes. Folks don't never confess anything until they get caught. And I don't think Achan would have ever said a thing if he hadn't got caught. But when he got caught, verse 21 says in chapter 7, When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment, 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted thee. A brother, coveting things will get you in trouble every time. 
And, and Achan coveted them. And when he coveted them, what did he do? He took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver's under it. So they went and they retrieved the stolen items. They took Achan. Now listen, only Achan sinned. But Achan's whole household suffered the punishment for that sin. The Bible said they took Achan, they took his sons, they took his daughters, they took his tent, they took all of his possessions, and they took them outside of the, uh, the cave, and there in the valley of Achor, all Israel stoned them to death, and they buried what was left outside the city. Now that sin had been taken care of, God tells Joshua, it said, take all the people, not a few of them, but you take all the people and return to Ai. He guarantees victory for Israel. Unlike Jericho, here we see a rather conventional battle plan. Let me give it to you, and we won't read it all. Joshua moves into the valley. And Joshua's going to be out there in the valley, and the next morning, the king, the Bible said of Ai, comes out and he moves against Joshua. And in the mind of the king of Ai, he's probably thinking, well, we can go out there and take these folks because after all, we've already defeated them once, so won't be any problem defeating them again. So let's go get them. And I, I don't know if, if it was supreme confidence that the king of Ai had or as a bit of insanity that moved, motivated the king, but he left the city completely defenseless. He took every man, he took everybody that was able to, to fight, and he pursued after Joshua and his men. And their confidence soared as Joshua and his men began to run from the men of Ai. And they seen them fleeing again, and they said, boy, we've got them on the run again, and their confidence soared. But as soon as the men of Ai were drawn away from the city, the soldiers placed near the wall moved inside the city, and they set fire on the city. And the Bible says when the men of Ai saw their city on fire, they stopped their pursuit they were, and were completely destroyed. The Bible said the entire population of Ai, some 12,000 were destroyed, with the only exception being the king of Ai. They took the cattle, they took the valuables, and they took them off the Lord's treasury. And then the Bible said they hanged the king. Boy, there's a lot in that, isn't there? That's just the story, because I had to tell you two chapters, and I won't do it without reading it all, too. Now I'm going to give you five lessons that we will learn from this passage. Number one, there's no excuse for failure. There is no excuse for failure. God promised victory if they would simply follow his plan. God has promised you and I victory if we follow the plan that God has laid out. There was absolutely no excuse for failure at Ai. There may have been some reasons for their failure, but there were no excuses for their failure when they got to Ai. If you'd have asked Joshua why they were defeated, he'd have probably given you a couple of reasons, and he probably would have said, well, it's God's fault. <laughs> Don't we do that a lot of times? It's the Lord's fault. Something bad happens, something goes wrong. Who's the first person that gets the blame? The very one we didn't consult with to begin with, we didn't ask for his guidance, and when things fall apart and things fail, we have a tendency to want to blame God. And he could have said that. Of course, later he'd understood the real reason wasn't God's fault, it was their own fault. Second, he could have said that Israel had sinned against God by taking the first thing when he found that out. Certainly that was the major reason. Or third, he could have said that they had erred and taken only two or three thousand men when they should have taken all the people as God later told him to do. They may have been a lot of reasons, but there was no excuse for losing that battle at Ai. There's no excuse for a Christian to fail. The Lord has promised you and I everything necessary for victory as a Christian in this life. So there's no reason for us to fail. 
Well, to succeed as a child of God, he gives us an infallible guide in the person of the Holy Spirit. He walks with us. He guides us. He leads us on an everyday basis. And let me tell you this. He will never lead you wrong. When you mess up, it's because you didn't follow. So he's not going to lead you wrong. Then he places at our disposal unlimited power. And if we got unlimited power in the person of the Holy Spirit, there's no reason to fail. He guarantees us the same kind of victory he promised to Joshua. Now, there may be a reason for your failure, but there is no excuse. A man in business, and I've never been in business, but those that are in business and their business fails, they may blame it on a lot of things. They may blame it on a failed economy that caused their business to fail or inadequate financing on their part or, or improper procedures or it may have been laziness and you could go on with a list and a list of things. But the man that fails in business usually doesn't look for reasons but develops excuses to cover up why he didn't succeed. And we a lot of times do that same thing. We blame it on this and we blame it on that when we fail, when there's really no excuse for our failure. There's no excuse for our sins and our shortcomings. If you'll read 1 Corinthians 10, 13, you'll find out that there's no temptation taking you, but such is common to man. But God's faithful who will not tempt you above that which you're able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you might be able to bear it. So if God is going to be with you and God's faithful and God will get you through and you fail and you fall into sin, you've got nobody to blame but yourself. Amen? It's our own fault when we fail. A man may get drunk. There may be a reason why he gets drunk, but there's no excuse for it. There may be a reason why a man doesn't get along with his wife, but there's no excuse for it. And as Christians, we ought to get along. Then second thing I see in this passage, I only got five to look at right quickly, but the second thing is Satan's not an easy one. Don't you ever underestimate the power of the devil. The moment you became a Christian, Satan became your enemy. He'll try everything possible to get you to backslide and get you away from serving the Lord. And he'll work on me, he'll work on you. You say, preacher, I, I thought preachers were kind of exempt. Listen, if he, if, if he can start at the top and tear the top down, he can, he can do a fine job on the rest of the church. If there's one that he's going to battle within this church as much or more so than anybody else, it's going to be the man of God, the one that stands behind the pulpit and preaches the word of God. So I've got a battle with the devil every day. And the day that I got saved and the day that I became a Christian, I got engaged in a warfare, in a battle with the devil, and I'm going to be in that battle until I leave this world one day. So that's what makes me look forward to heaven is the time that the battle is going to be over with. And you ought to be looking for that. Christians don't fail because they don't love God. Christians don't fail because they fail to read their Bible. Christians don't fail because they don't pray. I believe we fail because we underestimate the power of the enemy and they don't know anything about the tricks of the devil. Listen, the devil is the master of deception. He'll deceive you in every way imaginable and possible to get you off track and get you to do things that you ought not to do. Now let me say this right here. He is not all powerful. God's the only one that's all powerful. He's not all powerful, but listen, he's the prince of this world. He's got a lot of power that's been granted unto him by God himself. He's got a lot of power, and we're no match for the devil, but I know one that is a match for the devil, and that's the one that hung on the cross and died in my stead. He's a match for the devil. I, I think a lot of times, somebody said one time, said, when the devil knocks on your heart's door, you just say, Jesus, you take care of it. You answer the door. Listen, the, the, uh, the devil still knows that the blood of Jesus Christ is no place for him. He can't cross over the bloodline, and you just claim victory through Jesus Christ. And that's where your victory will come from. So we fail because we underestimate the power of the devil. Paul said we're not ignorant of his devices. Don't you be ignorant of, of the devices of the devil. 
And in our text, Satan used discouragement to make Israel want to quit. It's difficult to fight when you're discouraged. Stop and think about that just a minute. Others devices he uses are suffering and, and, and failure. He also uses doubt. Is it ever caused you to sometimes want to doubt your salvation? All believers of Christian never been saved. There wasn't some time in their life the devil come along and said, you ain't saved. And that's why I'm glad that my salvation isn't based on my feelings. Amen. It's based upon what thus saith the word of God. And I can tell you, like the fellow said one time, he said the devil's come at me and tried to tell me that I wouldn't save. And he said, I tell the devil, hey, Satan, I remember where it happened at. I was there when it took place. And I know the Lord saved me, and I know I've been saved. Well, that's a good avenue. But a good way to show the devil that you've been saved is to do the same thing with the devil that the Lord did with him in the wilderness. Take the word of God and use it on the devil. And remind the devil, the Bible said, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And I remember the day that I called, and I know that the Lord saved me, and he forgave me, and I know I've been born again. So he'll try to get you to doubt your salvation, though. He may catch you to call, cause you to try to doubt the promises of God. What God has promised you, he will fulfill. I may promise you some things in this life and be unable to keep all the obligations and what I have promised you I would do. I think when we're unable to keep our promises, we ought to go to the person and explain to them why we can't do it. But if God makes you a promise, God will keep that promise. He never fails in it. And he may cause you to doubt Satan might do it. Some key doctrine that we, that we have in the word of God. Satan is out to destroy us any way he can. And Satan then can even use success as one of his devices. We need to guard against a feeling of well-being and self-confidence in our life. Boy, when you, you remember Elijah? Elijah had just won the victory on Mount Carmel. And Jezebel, after, after what had just went on, he had destroyed the 450 prophets of Baal. And in a little bit, Jezebel threatened the life of Elijah. And a man that had just won a victory like that on the hillside, you may think, man, he's just overflowing with confidence. He is overflowing with victory down in his heart. But you know what he did in the face of Jezebel when she threatened his life? He ran. From the presence of Jezebel. Instead of trusting in God, he ran. So when you're at success and you feel like you're on the mountain, you feel like nothing can ever go wrong again, you watch out. The devil will sometimes attack us in our strong points of life. So be on guard against this. We need to guard against what Satan does. And Satan's not all powerful as he said, but he has a great deal of power. And listen, he never gets discouraged. He never quits. We get discouraged and we quit sometimes, but Satan doesn't. And he stays at it all the time. Wouldn't you like just a little break once in a while? But he stays at us, doesn't he? He stays at you all the time. But I've got news for him. One day you're going to have to relinquish and it'll be all over. And I'm moving out of this world to a place that you cannot go. You was there once. And you tried to rise above God, and God cast you out. And when I get to heaven, Satan can't go there, and I'm thankful of that. Then the third thing, sin must be put away before we can ever uh, hear from God. The Bible said in Isaiah 59, 12, Behold, the Lord's hand's not shortened, that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities are separated between your, your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. It's not that God cannot hear, but he chooses not to hear when we have sin in our hearts. The Bible says in another place, and I forget exactly where the passage is, but it says if we regard iniquity in our heart, God will not hear us. So the first thing that we have to do, and I, I remember a brother back a few mountain years ago, and 
and, and he he'd come to the altar and I you know I, I I didn't understand a lot of things back then one of the first things he had done is get on the altar and start asking the Lord to forgive him of anything in his heart that might not be right between him and the Lord. And after a while, I began to understand that. Hey, we got to take care of the sin that's in our life in order for God to hear us. And we regard iniquity of God something in our life that's sinful that separates between us and God. we got to deal with the sin problem first. And that's what happened here with Israel. They had to take care of the sin problem before they could move on any farther. Our unconfessed sins causes God to turn his back on our prayers and he refuses to listen when we pray. God will not put a, a, a spiritual crowbar in you. Now listen to me. He won't put a spiritual crowbar in you and pry you open and look into our lives and open us up. A lot of times he'll just wait. Now he's waiting to hear from us, waiting to hear us come and pray. We can pray and pray. But the Bible said God will not move an inch and we'll confess that sin and get our lives right with him. Another Old Testament passage which serves well on this subject is found in Proverbs 28, 13. The Bible said, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy thing to do with your sins tonight is confess them and bring them before the Lord. You say, well, I, I, I've got mine covered. Achan thought he had his covered. In fact, he went back and put them in the tent, dug a hole under the tent, buried them in it, covered it over, walked outside the tent, said nobody saw me, so I got it made. But God saw me. God saw me. Friend, listen. Your sin that others may not know about, that may not ever be found out by anybody, they were found out by Almighty God the moment you committed them. Right. And the thing to do with that sin is confess it and bring it before the Lord. Sin's got to be first uncovered and then dealt with. You ever heard this one? I'm going to share it with you right now. Don't just sweep that thing under the rug. Because you know what? It has a tendency of getting out from under the rug every now and then, and you just still got to deal with it. So don't sweep it under the rug, confess it to God. Fourth thing, God doesn't want token involvement, He wants a total involvement for you and I. Israel failed at AI because they took only a small percentage of the people. However, when God had His way, and they went back in chapter number 8 and they destroyed AI, they took all the people. God didn't want token involvement. God wanted everybody involved. It's sad a lot of times that the vast majority of the work that's done in the local church is carried out by just a few faithful people. You know, I believe God wants us all involved. And it's my opinion, and I, you know, all of us got opinions, I guess, but it's my opinion that membership carries responsibility. Everybody ought to be involved in the work of the Lord. That includes me, that includes you. Now, the fifth thing, and I'm going to be done, and I'm going to let you just kind of lay back and relax there, and you lazy boy, and have a rest of the evening. The last thing, unless the enemy's defeated, you're going to have to fight him again and again and again as you go through life. Israel's going to have to fight at AI again because they didn't feed it, uh, AI the first time. And I want you to get this before I give you a little story about Sam Jones. I'm not talking about sinless perfection. If I was, we'd all be hurt. Because I fail and you fail and we all fail, probably some on an everyday basis. We fall and we come short of the glory of God. There's not one, there's, the Bible said there's none that doeth good, no, not one. We're all as an unclean thing in the sight of God. There's none of us that's good. So I'm not talking about sinless perfection, but I'm talking about gaining the victory over various sins in our life. Is there things tonight, as you listen to me, are there things that you are still battling with as a child of God? Things that you've not completely got the victory over? 
You may need to make just make you an altar there in your home tonight. Get down beside your recliner, bow somewhere, wherever that you at. Get down on your knees and say, Lord, there's something in my life that I've battled with and I've wrestled with and I've not gotten total victory over, but I'm going to nail that thing down tonight. I'm going to nail it to the cross of Jesus Christ. I'm going to get victory over it and I'm going to walk away from that thing tonight with the help of the Lord. There's a story about Sam Jones. Sam Jones was an old Methodist preacher. That's back in the day, brother, when... Uh, it wasn't just one denomination, but all of them preached hard on the Word of God. And Methodists, the old-timey Methodists, they, they, they preached her straight down the line. And Sam Jones was a Methodist preacher. But the story said he wasn't always a Methodist preacher. <laughs> he wasn't always a saved man. At one time, he was one of the most brilliant attorneys that there was in the state of Georgia. But he fell in love with the Bible. And Sam Jones became a drunk. He virtually lived in the local saloon there where he lived. One wintry night, the story says, as they're preparing to close the door of the saloon, the bartender came over and literally had to take Sam Jones and throw him uh, out the door uh, of the saloon and out into the alley. And he said he just lay there in his own vomit and he went off to sleep. Early the next morning, it began to snow and Finally, half frozen, covered with snow, Sam managed to stand up. He weaved his way back into the saloon and asked the bartender for some of that as he uh, said of, as it was, some of that slop head whiskey. Said it was the cheapest that they made. And said the bartender pulled out a bottle, handed it to Sam. Sam Jones said that as he stood there with that bottle in his hand, he noticed himself over in the mirror. And he said his hair was matted and uh, vomit was on his filthy clothes. Three months beard was on his face. And said, Sam said, I couldn't help but think, is this the man that was once among the most brilliant lawyers there were in the state of Georgia? Said all of a sudden, Sam threw that bottle down. He dropped to his knees and began to cry. And he said, God have mercy on me. God have mercy on me. Said the bartender, thinking Sam was dying, ran around the corner, around the bar, and asked Sam, said, Sam, what's wrong? Is there something we could do? And Sam just said, leave me alone. Finally, Sam got off the saloon floor. He walked down to a local clothing store owned by a friend of his. He asked if he'd let him have some new clothes. He said, Sam Jones is coming back. The man gave him a new suit of clothes plus some underwear. And as Sam left the store, the man placed a $100 bill in his hand. Next, Sam went to the local barber where he got a shave, got a haircut, got himself a bath. And he left and he said, Sam Jones is coming back. The next, Sam went to a local rooming house where he stayed for three days and nights as he dried out. He said that it was the closest thing to hell that he ever wanted to go through. Sam said that on the morning of the fourth day, something glorious happened. He said, Jesus came by that way and saved the soul of Sam Jones. Amen. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Amen. Sam then made his way home to a wife that he had many, on many occasions beaten black and blue, to a woman he had treated so badly. He shuddered at the reception that he was going to receive. He knocked on his own door. And when his wife answered the door, she started to slam and said, in fact, with his new clothes and his shave and his haircut, she is slow to even recognize who her husband was. And finally, Sam said, I know I've been a sorry husband. I don't blame you for slamming the door in my face, but I need to tell you one thing before you do. Jesus saved my worthless soul this morning. The new Sam Jones had come home. Said his wife literally jumped in his arms and said, Oh Sam, I've prayed for years that God save you. And she said, Thank you, Jesus, Amen. that you saved my Amen. husband. But there's a little part that Sam wrote in that story that probably a lot of us would like left out. 
But they said Sam used it a lot of times later in his messages. And said later Sam rode by that same saloon. He thought he'd go in and speak to the old gang. Said he tied his horse at the same hitching post he used when he frequented that saloon as a customer. Said inside he began to laugh. It wasn't long before old Sam was drunk again. And said it was this incident that Sam would later use in his sermons when he would say this. When you get saved, you better change hitching post. <laughs> he learned a lesson when he went back that day. Sam had not defeated that enemy, and he had to battle that enemy again in his life. Listen, if you've not got victory over a certain thing in your life, you'll have to continually battle it time after time after time after time. But you can have victory over it tonight. You may have to, have to change your favorite hangout. You may have to get some new friends because the old ones will keep trying to get you to drink and keep you trying to get you to take drugs or do that which you've been given victory over. Listen, I found a whole group of new friends. And they're called saved people in the house of the Lord. And they try to help one another. Sometimes you may have to change friends. Israel didn't defeat Ai the first time. And they were now going to have to fight the same battle all over again. Whatever the enemy is that's attacking you in your Christian life, it's got to be destroyed in order for you to have victory over it. We'll later see that because Israel didn't obey God and completely defeat the Philistines, you remember them? Boy, they were a constant thorn in the, in the side of, of Israel. They, 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 they had to battle them. They would continue to have to fight the Philistines because they didn't do the job the first time. Tonight I want to close with this little thought and I'm going to let you go. It might be a matter of just bringing that thing to the Lord and crucifying it on the cross. In Christ you have victory. Because he's already nailed it to the cross anyway. Amen. We sing a song quite often in our churches. And it's one of my favorites. I like it. It's entitled Victory in Jesus. Folks, there's victory in the Lord tonight. Whatever you're battling in life, it may be something that's been a constant thorn in your flesh for a long, long time. You may have been saved for years, but you're still battling it. Won't you get it nailed to the cross tonight? Get victory over it. Maybe it's some little thing that you're constantly fighting and battling with. Let's nail it to the cross tonight. Let's get victory over it. And then you can sing tonight when we get done with this message here in just a minute. You can sing and mean what the songwriter said when he said there's victory. There's victory in Jesus. Whatever it is, bring it to the Lord tonight. If you're not a Christian, get saved. If you're listening to me tonight, You've not ever given your heart and Lord to, a heart, a heart to the Lord. Why don't you give your, give your heart to the Lord tonight and ask Him to come into your life to save your soul? If you'll do it, He'll do His part. He'll save you. And tonight, if you've been battling something, maybe been for the last little while, maybe for a long time, get victory from it. Just bring it to the Lord and nail it to the cross. Leave it in the arms of Jesus tonight and claim the victory. Let's pray and we're going to look close. Father, we're thankful for the time that you've allowed us to spend together this afternoon. Those that uh, have been listening tonight by Facebook, and I know this is a little bit different approach than we've been using for the last few months, but Lord, 2020 has been an upside down year anyway. We've not known hardly from one week to the next what we're going to be able to do and what new restrictions and what new guidelines there may be placed on us. And we don't know what tomorrow may hold. Lord, you know what tomorrow holds. And we know in our hearts who holds tomorrow, and that's you. And we rejoice in that fact. But Lord, it's been a tough year that we've gone through. But Lord, I thank you for the avenue that we have tonight by the way of Facebook that we can still come to this church 
And I'm still standing in this pulpit and I'm still preaching the Word of God. And folks can sit in their homes and listen to the preached Word of God. And we thank you for that this evening. So I pray right now, take the Word of God, bring conviction into hearts of those that have listened tonight. And Lord, you just, you just stirred my heart so as we sit this past week and, and worked on getting things situated right as the Holy Spirit spoke to our heart with this message. And then Lord, I, I, I doubt that there's any of us that don't have some little thing in our life that keeps raising its ugly head. We need to get victory over that tonight. And if we don't, it'll just keep bringing its ugly head back up. So Lord, may we claim the victory that only comes through Jesus Christ. Thank you for this time we've spent together this evening. Thank you for the Word of God. Thank you for helping us be with our people. Be with those that are going to travel from our church this week. Lord, give them a good time. Bring them back home safely, I pray. In Jesus' name, and amen. May God bless you as we close out the service tonight. Thank you for listening. Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, we'll be back with you. We look forward to being here with you. We'd like to say, too, we appreciate Brother Stan Fry. Brother Stan comes and he does all the uh, 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 putting the, our services on Facebook, takes of his time, and, and every time I thank him, he said, glad to do it. But Stan, we appreciate you tonight. Thank you for what you do. God bless you. Have a good week in the Lord. See you Wednesday night.